this recording? It's a little bit disconcerting. <laughs> um, so, um, all right, how do I get this started? Just the arrows. Use the arrows. Okay. They work? Um, oh, the arrows on the computer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm really pleased to be back here at GSE. Um, as Amina was saying, I um, was a student here, and I graduated in 2007 with a doctorate in the Education, Culture, and Society program. Um, while I was here, I took advantage of all of Penn's resources and did a lot of work in anthropology as well as in African studies um, and really enjoyed doing that degree because I could do so many different kinds of things while I was here. Um, but also while I was here, um, there was a very curious thing happening here at GSC where there were lots of us who had international interests and we recognized that among the faculty here there were a lot of people with good strong international expertise but there really wasn't a mechanism to kind of bring people together. Um, so I'm thrilled that this program exists, that you guys have such a strong and robust master's program, um, but that also this program can kind of be a hub for people who have international interests across the school. Um, just as I was leaving, there was sort of a small advisory group of us that was starting to come together with some of the faculty, um, including Professor Wagner, um, to sort of pull people together and to start to try to pull these resources together, and I think that that eventually led to the formation of this program. So it's really nice to see all of this coming together, and it sort of feels really good to be coming back here after all of these um, years to, to see the fruits of that sort of early labor and bringing this together. I wish this had been here when I had been here, because it would have been nice to find community. We used to kind of bump into each other in the hallways and say, oh yeah, you're interested in that, and that's how we found each other. Um, so it's nice that you have something that you can actually find each other in a more formal way. Um, I wanted to start with, with just a little bit of my own biography, because it's a little bit of an unusual biography for an academic, and I think it explains sort of the take that I have on my particular work and why my work is a little bit different than a lot of educational research. Um, as I said before, I, I started out here at GSE um, and did a very interdisciplinary degree, but a degree in education, um, which is something that, that the program here at Penn allows you to do. Um, during that process, I was really drawn to anthropology, and so I started doing a lot of work in anthropology. Um, and I came very, very close to doing a joint degree with anthropology, which many, many of the people in the ECS doctoral program do a joint degree either with anthropology or history or sociology or other fields. Um, however, I couldn't do that, that joint degree, um, and I couldn't do it for, for personal reasons, which have an awful lot to do with the genesis of my research. Um, when I came into the program here, like many people, I didn't know what I wanted to do research on, I didn't know what I was interested in, but I'd spent two years in Eritrea as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, while I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Eritrea, um, I met the man who has become my husband, um, who's an Eritrean, um, and so throughout the course of being in my doctoral program, um, I was sort of trying to figure out how to get him to the U.S., um, and for various complicated reasons that will become more apparent as I start my presentation, um, I didn't succeed in doing that. So when it came time that I was finished my coursework and I had to go off and find a field site somewhere, um, there was no choice. I had to go back to Eritrea. We'd been doing a long distance marriage for a long time and I was done with it. Um, so I had to go back and the anthropology program sort of said, yes, we'd love to have you do a joint degree, but you have to stay here for another year. And I just wasn't really prepared to, to be stuck in the United States for another year. So I didn't actually do the joint degree, but um, that's always been something I've, I've been a little bit sad um, about. Um, and I did come really, really close to doing that. Um, so in, in many ways, my research has sort of always felt this tension between being educational research and thinking about what are the needs of educational research to improve educational institutions or to improve processes of development on one hand, and what are sort of the broader interests of various disciplines in the academy, the kind of theoretical interests of anthropology um, and other areas on the other hand. And so I've always really felt that kind of tension. Um, just as I was graduating from this program, um, through a combination of serendipity, chance, luck, um, and a, a sort of very fortuitous email that was forwarded to me from Arcadia University via Dr. Wagner. Um, I landed a job at Arcadia University, which is where I currently work. However, that job is actually not in education. So here I am, a scholar trained in the field of education who's jumped out of education. This is a very unusual thing to do in, in academia. Um, my current position is in international studies, which is a very interdisciplinary field with sort of strong legs in political science. So now we're bringing in a totally new discipline that I really have no training in at all. Um, and my own interest in anthropology. Um, and it was a bunch of historians that hired me, so that kind of brings a whole other element into it. Um, so I got this wonderful job at Arcadia University, and I loved it, and it's a wonderful place to work. Um, and I thought, oh great, now I'm not in the Ned School, I'm in, I'm in an international studies program, now I get to be a real anthropologist. <laughs> so after going around in all those different directions, I finally sort of have, has really kind of forged my career as an anthropologist, and I mainly publish um, and engage with the scholarly community of anthropology. Um, 
But I've also sort of always tried to kind of keep an awareness of the other interdisciplinary realms, including education, that I engage with. Um, as you just heard, I, I, about a year and a half ago, I got a Spencer National Academy of Education postdoctoral fellowship, um, which has really sort of drawn me back into the world of education. So I've spent um, the last six years or so thinking about how my research engages in African studies and in international studies and in anthropology. And now I'm just at the beginning of starting to think about, okay, so what can this say to education? What can this say to educational literatures and to the needs of people who are concerned about education around the world? Um, so my hope is, that's sort of a long rambling introduction, my hope is that as you guys hear my talk that um, I'll give you something that you find interesting, but my hope is also that you guys might be able to help give me some insight into how this research fits in with the world of education since I haven't, that's, well, that's where I started from, that's not really what I've thought about in, in quite a long time. Um, so that's sort of my general biography and how all of this fits together and I'll talk as I go through this, um, if anyone's curious, more about kind of my relationship with my husband and the Eritrean state and how all of that um, figures into all of this as well because it's been a kind of interesting and complicated process as we've gone through this. Um, so the, the main research that I'm talking about today is research that derives from my dissertation. So it is based on research that at this point is historical in Eritrea. It's from a time period of 2003 to 2005, um, as well as various pilot studies and other visits to Eritrea between 1990, and my own residence in Eritrea between 1995 and, and 2003. So it draws specifically from the years 2003 to 2005, but more generally from a decade of engagement with Eritrea. And there's an element of my work that's kind of autoethnographic as well, autobiographical, that I reflect a lot on my own sort of pre-research experiences there as well. Um, so I thought it would be useful to start with some context of Eritrea because it's a very small East African nation that many people haven't heard very much about. Um, that's a map just to let you know where we're located, sort of sandwiched between Ethiopia, Sudan, and the Red Sea. Um, the place where I did my field work is way down here at the tip of Eritrea in a town called Asif, which is right very close to the border of Djibouti and Ethiopia. Um, Eritrea was an Italian colony, um, and unlike many countries in Africa, um, around the time that, that colonial powers were sort of giving up the ghost and countries were becoming independent, um, Eritrea faced a, str a strange situation because Ethiopia um, laid claim to Eritrea and said, no, Italy took it from us and it still belongs to us. Um, and, and so, uh, instead of give, being given independence, Eritrea was, was federated with Ethiopia and then later annexed with Ethiopia. Um, that was a very complex process. At the time, some Eritreans supported it, some didn't. Um, eventually, the majority of Eritreans opposed it, and at that point, Eritrea's 30-year war for independence began um, in the early 60s, and that war for independence lasted until Eritrea became an independent sovereign nation in 1991. Um, I went to Eritrea for the first time in 1995, and it was, um, it was sort of an amazing time to be there. It was four years after um, de facto independence, um, three years after Eritrea's sort of official independence, when, when they were officially awarded statehood. Um, everyone was very excited, everyone was very hopeful, everyone was powerfully nationalistic and willing to um, work for the country and struggle for the country and help develop and build the country. It was really just an amazing time to be there, where there was this amazing spirit of working together to help the country. Um, all of that went along pretty well, and things seemed to be on a pretty good trajectory um, until 1998, when much to everybody's surprise, a border war with Ethiopia broke out. Um, the border war sort of officially wrapped up in 2000, and there hasn't been any, any fighting since then. Um, however, the war is still, from Eritrea's perspective, the war is still not entirely resolved. Um, according to an agreement between the two countries, there was a, a, a sort of delineation of the border, um, but Ethiopia has not accepted that delineation of the border, so Eritrea sort of, sort of still very much regards itself as engaged in a Cold War with, with Ethiopia. Um, and in a minute you'll see why that has been so significant for shaping Eritrea's sort of heavily militarized form of nationalism. I should have mentioned, if anyone has questions as I go through, um, I'm happy to take questions as I go along. If I say anything that's confusing or you'd like more information about, um, I may be throwing a lot of information on you, so if anyone wants to pick up on a point or ask about it later in the question and answer, um, please feel free to do so. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the political climate in Eritrea that's developed since 1998. Um, Eritrea is now a highly militarized single-party state. Um, military and political power is centralized around the figure of the president. Um, it's a dictatorship. Um, for all intents and purposes. Um, around the time that I was doing my dissertation research and writing my dissertation, um, I was very hesitant to use words like authoritarian regime and dictator because they just seemed so predetermined and I wasn't yet convinced that those words were descriptive. Um, I'm pretty comfortable using them now because I think that um, they do describe what's happened in Eritrea anytime you have a president who's been in power for over 20 years. 
Um, and there have been no elections, and there are no additional parties, and people are not allowed to engage in any form of political protest or political organization. Um, that pretty much looks like a dictatorship and an authoritarian regime. It's no longer a regime in transition. That's a little bit too long for a transition. Um, so I'm much more comfortable with using that terminology than I used to. Um, in some other parts of my work, I'm sort of thinking through what terms like authoritarianism mean. What, what does an authoritarian regime mean? Is that a useful term for us? And so I can talk more about that if anyone's curious about that. Um, so as I said, there were there are no opportunities for political mobilization outside of the government party sponsor, party organizations and mechanisms. Um, the government has a, a very low tech but fairly extensive surveillance mechanism over the entire population. Um, there are various checkpoints set up either in the large cities or on the major roads throughout the country where buses and vehicles and individuals on foot are stopped and asked for identification cards. Um, anyone can be arrested and detained without cause. Um, in fact, one of the practices that, that got the government engages in is a practice called gifa, which kind of translates as roundup. Um, and that's basically when the government decides that too many people are avoiding national service, military service, and so they're just going to kind of round people up and ask them to get on trucks and take them to a detention center and process their paperwork. Um, and basically, if they, if they show that you have an ID and you have a reason that you are allowed to be sort of walking freely on the street, you're okay and you get released after a few hours. Um, but if you're not, then you'll be, you can be detained, you can be sent back into military service, other things can happen to you. Um, but it's a government that feels like it can act with impunity on all of the bodies of its citizens, regardless of whether they have just cause or not. Um, there's a lot of other cases of people being arrested without, real, without due cause, not being tried, being kept for a long period of time. So it's generally a place with a very, very poor record of human rights and civil liberties. Um, one of the things that's very notable and striking about, about Eritrea is its mass permanent militar, mil, form of militarization and conscription. Um, there are many, many countries around the world that have mandatory um, military service. Um, and there are a couple of no, several notable examples where military service is really deeply embedded with, with people's sense of national identity. Um, Israel is an example of this. Turkey is a great example of this. Um, Cuba in, in previous decades was a good example of this, and those are just to name a few. There are many, many countries that sort of wrap their national identity or up, up in a sense of military identity, and everyone is required to do military service, or at least men are required to. Um, and this is sort of the, the groundwork, the framing of what people's national identity is. Um, and Eritrea sort of modeled itself after these. It thought it's a country that was sort of born out of a long protracted armed struggle. Um, and it thinks of itself as a militarized nation where a military identity is really part and parcel of what it means to be Eritrean. Um, an interesting um, difference between some of those other states that I mentioned in Eritrea is that Eritrea requires both men and women to do military service. So whereas military identity um, is, is often a very, very masculine military national identity in Eritrea, it's sort of gender neutral because everyone's expected to do this. Um, but the truly striking thing about Eritrea's military service is that um, by default, if not by design, it has become effectively permanent for large numbers of Eritreans. Um, I'll talk in a minute about what the mechanism is that makes it permanent for many, many Eritreans. It's not permanent for all Eritreans at this point, but Eritreans have a general sense that once they are in the military, that this is inescapable and it's not something that they can get out of. Um, conditions in military service are extremely harsh. Um, Again, this is partly by design, that they want to make sure that their soldiers are sort of able to survive in very harsh conditions. To some degree, this is what happens in the military everywhere. Um, Eritrea's case is, is a little bit more harsh than everywhere, and then it's, it's permanence is the other um, condition that makes it particularly harsh. Um, another thing that's particularly striking about Eritrea um, is that emigration is effectively illegal. Um, technically, according to their laws, um, it's not illegal. Once you've completed your military service, you are allowed to get an exit visa and to leave the country. Um, however, since so many people don't finish their military service, where they finish, but the government sort of says, oh, well, we're not really ready to let you go because we could go back to war with Ethiopia. So there's a lot of kind of hedging around who's allowed to get an exit visa. Um, and that's incidentally why when I finished up my coursework here at GSE, I had to move back to Eritrea because my husband, who had finished the military component of his national service and should have been finished with his national service entirely, um, was told by the government, sorry, we can't let you leave. We're not letting anyone leave yet, even though he was finished with what he should have had to do. Um, and he was in the same boat with um, the vast majority of, of Eritreans, men, women, educated, uneducated, um, in that, at, at that time. Um, because immigration is effectively illegal, um, thousands, um, by most estimates, flee illegally each month um, and face great danger in doing so, not only once they get across the border into Sudan or Ethiopia, they face various dangers. Um, but there are reported shoot-to-kill policies at the border, and those who are caught trying to escape are often, are often detained. Um, but that doesn't seem to stop many people from continuing to try to escape. So that's the overview of the climate. Um, 
in Eritrea. Um, many of these things were, all of these things were in place at the time that I was doing my field work from 2003 to 2005. Um, many are still um, in place. Most have worsened in some form or another. Um, there's a couple of things that have gotten better, which better in some ways, um, which I can talk a little bit about, but most of, mostly this is sort of still an accurate snapshot of what's going on in Eritrea. Um, so an overview of the research that I did between 2003 and 2005. Um, I'm an ethnographer. I'm, you guys probably figured that out. So that means I go to sort of observation-oriented, qualitative interviews and observations um, at various levels. I, I did sort of a really kind of old-school ethnography where I went into a couple of schools and just kind of hung out with people day after day after day and hung out with them on the weekends and on their vacations and really got to know people really well. Um, so some people do ethnographic research that sort of goes broad and they try to cover a lot of schools and a lot of ground. Um, and they don't go as deep. And I did a more traditional kind of, I'm going to just go into two schools that are sort of in a community together and, and really get to know these places really well. Um, my focus was on teachers, so I was mainly spending a lot of time with teachers. Um, and the two schools, one was a junior secondary school and one was a senior secondary school, so that roughly covered the grades, grades 5 to 11. Um, to supplement that, I also did interviews with, with people who worked in the Ministry of Education, both in the capital city of Asmara, as well as in the town that I was living in, Asif. Um, I did some observations of teacher trainings, um, and like I said, I hung out with teachers on their vacations when they typically went um, to the capital city to visit their families. Um, so I did more, I, I also did some kind of contextualizing um, research about what was going on in Eritrea. And, and I lived everyday life with Eritreans, so that's how I, I, I got an in-depth sense of how things like mass roundups were affecting people's lives, how things like knowing that many of your relatives are um, in the military or waiting to go back to the front affects people. Lives. Um, Eritrea is a very small country of about 4.5 million people, so all of these things become very intimate. Um, they all have a, a sort of deep and profound effect on the entire population. Um, so the main questions I was interested in were, um, also, it, it's not the way I went in. I, w I went in thinking that um, when I was sort of developing and planning my research, I thought what I was going to be looking at was nationalism and how teachers might have a different sense of nationalism than, um, than the government itself. Um, I, and I did look at that, but what I found was really salient as I got into my research was really understanding what, what does the state mean from this kind of perspective, um, and particularly what kinds of state actors are teachers under these kinds of conditions. Um, and of course, the impact of this form of mass militarization and political rep repression on the formation of national identities in schools became a really salient question in the course of my research. Um, on a more theoretical level, I'm really interested in the evolving relationship between the nation and the state. We often sort of lump nation and state together and sort of take that hyphen between them for granted. Um, and so I'm really interested in saying, well, can we, can we continue to do that? Are nation and state necessarily the same thing? So that's something that I've also been thinking about. So I should, I should mention um, as I go on in my presentation that um, I may be throwing too much at you guys, that my approach to doing this, I was told to give an informal talk, so um, I don't know how I interpret that, how you interpret an informal <laughs> talk. But, but what, I'm, what I'm effectively doing, I'm in, I'm in mid process of writing a book. Um, so what I'm effectively doing here is kind of giving you guys sort of a smattering and an overview of my research. So rather than picking one component and sort of making a very specific argument, I'm sort of throwing a lot of stuff at you guys. Um, and then if you're curious about any component of that, a theoretical component, a contextual component, one particular sub-argument that I'm making, um, I'm happy to go into more detail about that. But um, I'm going to sort of give you a general sense of the research I did, the central questions, the theoretical framework that I was, that I was drawing on. Um, and then I'll give you some sampling of a couple of the different elements of ethnographic data that I came up with and then we'll sort of open it up for discussion and you guys can pick up on whatever kind of interests you or whatever I confused you about or whatever I didn't give you enough information about. Um, so when, uh, when, how many people are, are familiar with ethnography and the kind of research ethnography is? So a couple of people kind of are and I just tossed out to you guys that I know you have to do a qualitative and a quantitative um, research method for, for what you're doing. Um, one of the things that, that ethnography is a research, it's a qualitative form of, of research, so it's not based on sort of large N numbers. Um, it's based on sort of really getting in and observing how people are living. Um, but one of the things that's often typical of ethnographic studies is, of course, we go in with questions and an idea of what we're going to find and what we're going to learn, um, or an idea of what we want to learn. But what often happens, because context is messy, that any time you get into, any, any of you guys have traveled, you've lived, you know this, but any time you get on the ground in a school or another institution or elsewhere, you find that it's not, it doesn't look like it says in the books. It's always messier. It's always more convoluted. It's always more complex. So what often happens to ethnographers when they're on the ground 
doing research is that we find that the questions that we thought were really important really aren't the questions that are important in that particular context. Um, so then you have to kind of alter it. So you, then you say, well, this is what people really are concerned with here, and this is what's really going on here. But then you have to sort of go back to your original questions because the literature and the scholars who are back here in the United States have a different set of concerns. So ethnography is often a process of going back and forth between what you think your questions were, which is really driven by what other researchers in the general public in a place like the United States want to know, what's really going on in your field site, and the questions that the people that you're doing research with, your, your research participants, think is important. And that's kind of constantly going back and forth between that. So I thought I had a set of questions about national identity. Um, then I got into the context and sort of realized that what teachers were really concerned with was this government that was kind of running amok and setting up these policies that went directly, that were directly opposed to their sense of values. Um, and so over the, over the years as I've written about this, and it's gone through many different incarnations, um, I've sort of come up with the idea that these are the kinds of questions that are kind of bringing those two things together. Um, and one of the kinds of questions that I'm interrogating is what kinds of political or state actors are teachers. Um, at this point, a lot of people look at me and they're like, what do you mean teachers are state actors? Like politicians are state actors and, and other people are state actors. How do we know that teachers are state actors? Um, the easy answer to this question is that all of the, school, the school system in Eritrea and many parts of the world, actually, is highly, highly centralized. Um, so schools are state institutions. There are almost no private schools in Eritrea. Um, but even in a school system where there is a strong private system, if there's a strong state-run, centralized education system, teachers are the state actors who are charged with creating national identities and students and building a sense of citizenship. Um, so teachers very definitely are state actors. They're employed by the state. They are often the first state actor or the first encounter with the state that students will have um, as, as young people. They're charged with politically socializing young people, whether they know it or not. Teachers sometimes don't know it, which is sort of interesting. Um, but they are very definitely at least situated to, to be state actors. Um, the other questions that I got interested in is given that they're state actors, how do teachers constrain or enable the development of particular kinds of political identities? How do they shape the way that students think about their government, the state, the nation? Um, and how are teachers' own political identities or agency constrained and enabled by government policies? So a few theoretical starting points. I'm not going to um, hit you over the head with theory because I sort of recognize that probably for a lot of you the theoretical frameworks that I'm coming out of are, are maybe quite different from where you guys are coming out of. Um, I'm really drawing a lot of theory from um, political anthropology, um, which also has some relevancy in educational anthropology, um, and really specifically from the anthropology of the state and the anthropology of nationalism. Um, most of us have a sort of taken for granted understanding of what a nation and nationalism and national identity are. Um, if we haven't thought about it too much, we probably think that it's either that it's one of two things, that a nation is sort of, of course, nations are there, they're kind of naturalized and normalized, and um, there are these entities that just exist in the world, and we just feel like we belong to them or we don't. Um, once you start scratching the surface of that and start studying it, you sort of realize that really what a nation and a national identity is, is something that has to be constructed, it has to be created, it has to be a project. Um, usually this is a project of the national elite. Um, it might be a project of the artists, it might be a project of the government, it might be a project of the media, as it is in the United States most of the time. Um, that somehow the way that we come to understand ourselves as national and think of ourselves as national, um, we learn that from somewhere. And we learn it from a pretty young age. We get socialized into it by our parents, but they got socialized from some other space. So this is not a naturally occurring entity. It's something, this is a learned behavior. And schools, of course, have a very, very um, powerful and profound role to play in shaping this imagined community of the nation. Um, a very influential scholar by the name of Benedict Anderson sort of coined the term um, nations are imagined communities, which basically means that a nation is not a fixed material entity. It's something that we understand that we are part of a nation because we imagine it, because we think of it, because we collectively imagine it, because we all sort of have some sort of sense of what that means. Um, but it's also important to think that, um, that nations are also felt. So this is not an intellectual process. This is a lot of the literature on nationalism treats nations as if, if you just teach people and teach children about nationalism, um, that people will be national. And that's not enough. Nations are something that people are typically willing to kill and die for. This is something that is powerfully, powerfully emotional. So at some point, nations have to be effervescent. They have to be, they have to be emotional. Um, this feeling often comes from sort of performances of the nation, often these are rituals of the nation, if we think of national celebrations. When I first went to Eritrea in 1995, one of the things that struck me was on Independence Day, on May 24th, I went to an Independence Day celebration. And in many respects, this looked a lot like a Fourth of July celebration here in the United States. There were fireworks, there were people, there was a band, 
the difference was that there was this palpable sense of emotion. Um, people were really feeling this. And of course that makes sense. We're four years out of it, away from independence in 1995 in Eritrea, whereas in the United States, we're, we're how many hundreds of years? We can't remember it. We don't have that sense, same sense of feeling for the most part. Um, but if we think in, in the United States, we have other parallels of things that make us feel the nation. Um, I was really struck by a lot of, sort of people's comments and Facebook posts and things about 9-11 yesterday. And this is one of the ways that we feel our nation in, this, in the United States. Um, so often the government choreographs these performances and rituals that help people feel the nation. And, and Independence Day celebrations are one of those. Other kinds of celebrations and rituals are one of those. Um, schools have all kinds of rituals around the nation. Almost every school has either a Pledge of Allegiance or a flag ceremony or something like that that helps people sort of feel attachments to the nation in some way or the other. Um, but one thing that's not covered in the literature on nationalism quite so much um, is the idea that all of these sort of choreographed state-sponsored celebrations also draw on people's lived experiences. And one of the things that gives them power is the fact that people have lived through them. Um, this is particularly salient in Eritrea, where most Eritreans lived through, the, at the time of my fieldwork, lived through the, the, independent, the war for independence. Um, they, many of them lived either in Ethiopia or in Eritrea. They lived through Ethiopian rule. They lived through um, all of these kinds of experiences. So independence actually palpably meant something different to them. So they, they also had these lived experiences to draw on, um, which sort of contradict or don't contradict what the government said. This, this notion that lived experiences affects how you feel the nation becomes really important when you think about some of the ways in which the Eritrean state changed direction and started to behave in very, very different ways after the border war in 1998. And a lot of people, all of those powerful, strong sentiments about the nation and we love our nation and we'll do anything for it, really kind of eroded after that point in part because they had such a strong felt lived experience of the nation, which was no longer lived in those times after that. Um, so that's sort of the literature on, um, on the anthropology of nationalism and, and some of my interventions into that, drawing on lived experience as well as sort of state, the state project of developing a nation. Um, the other piece comes from the anthropology of the state. Um, now states are also imagined like the nation, but um, this, and this is a little bit unusual because most people think, well, the state, of course it exists. It's this like mechanism of government or something like that. Um, the anthropology of the state, for the most part, sort of starts from the assumption that states, and many political scientists also write about this, so it's not just a crazy anthropologist, um, but start from the assumption that states don't really exist. And if we think about it, this kind of makes sense. What's really the state? Um, is it really the mechanisms of the government working together? Um, is that really the state, or is that a bunch of relationships between different people. Is the state when you like go to the DMV to get your driver's license or to get your car registered or, or something like that? Um, is the state when you go to a public school and you have an encounter with a teacher? Is all of that together the state? Um, so when you think about it, the state is actually our encounters with these individual people combined with how we think about the state. Um, so I'm coming from an anthropological perspective that suggests that to understand what the state is, and how people think of the, of the state, that we have to look at sort of in discourse, in language, how is the state talked about, but also how is it encountered in our everyday encounters with the state. So how do we think about our politicians and what they're doing, and the president and what he's doing, but also how do we encounter the people that we see as sort of coming down from these decisions? How do we understand how we encounter these kinds of decisions? Um, and of course, I'm looking at that from the perspective of teachers who see themselves as engaging with the state um, as its employees, but they are also the sort of front line of the state for the students who are coming to them. Um, so this comes from an idea of discourse or language about the state combined with lived everyday experiences in the state. Um, now in authoritarian regimes like Eritrea, this is particularly complicated because all of the media is government sponsored. So on television and on the radio, you're not going to get a really sort of I mean, of course, it's going to be the government is, is wonderful, the government is glorious, the government wants you to sacrifice for it. Um, and by the time I was doing my field work, that had kind of worn thin. People weren't really buying that. So what stands in for that is, is often rumors. And people often talk about the state in the realm of rumor um, and sort of murmurings about what the state is doing this. And one of the articles that um, we circulated around that, that um, I have coming out in, in, a, in a month or two, um, actually one of the things that it really looks at is rumors and, and sort of everyday discourses of the punishing state. And this is a state that's trying to punish us. This is a state that's trying to hurt us. Um, and how teachers, both because of their particular encounters with their supervisors, but also because of the ways that they talked about the state, um, they thought of the, whole, the state as a whole as punishing. Um, they thought of the national service mechanism as punishing. They thought of their relationships with their supervisors as punishing. Um, and in another piece of my work, which I'm, I'm working on now, students actually thought of teachers as punishing also. So there's a whole other incarnation of what the punishing state means. Um, and then finally, I'm also interested, as I said before, in sort of how does the imagined nation and the imagined state, how do they relate to each other? When, when, when you imagine the, nation, the state as punishing, 
as many people in Eritrea did, um, or as dangerous, um, how does that affect the way you think about nationalism? Can you continue to manage to sort of think of yourself as willingly sacrificing for the nation and loving the nation um, when you um, feel like you're being punished by the state? Um, so that's the question I'm sort of interested in. There's a couple of scholars um, who have looked at the, sort of how the, 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 hyphen, the hyphen between nation and state is increasingly tenuous as a result of global processes. So I'm sort of asking, is what's going on in Eritrea similar to what's going on in other places where nation and state are sort of not always together? Sometimes those are different kinds of things. Um, let me pause there and see if anyone has any questions, because I feel like I tossed a lot of stuff out there. Um, I, don't, I don't know this region of the world very well at all. What was the... Was Eritrea more of a um, ethnically diverse, or was it basically formed by Italy as, after the colonial period, or does it have a, a did question. it have an identity <coughs> pre-colonial? That's a great question. Er Eritrean nationalism. Um, some Eritrean scholars would disagree with me about this, but, but after doing the fieldwork I've done and reviewing Eritrean textbooks, Eritrean nationalism really roots its origins with Italian. Um, and it's really interesting, in the seventh grade history textbook where this gets taken up, they actually describe the migrations of different peoples from different places that led to the formation of Eritrea, and then, it's like, and then it, Italian colonialism forged us as a nation. Um, so it's a, it's a nation that, um, one of the things that Benedict Anderson says is that nations have to imagine themselves, but they have to imagine themselves as modern, contemporary, because nation states are contemporary, but they also have to imagine themselves as ancient and kind of pro projecting themselves back into antiquity. One of the interesting things about Eritrea is that it's really embraced its own modernity. Um, it's really sort of said we don't need a history that projects us back into the past. Now, now part of this is sort of a, a kind of, it's to kind of counteract Ethiopian nationalism, which is the nationalism that was kind of, that was the operable other. Um, and Ethiopian nationalism, and, uh, until 1991, when Ethiopia went through some changes, projected itself into the past. So Ethiopian nationalism is a nationalism that says that we've had a continuous state since the third century. We are an ancient Christian nation. Um, and that's probably still pretty operable in, in Ethiopia, although there's been some moves away from that. Um, but Eritrea, I think, was trying to sort of say, yeah, Ethiopia claims that, but no nation was really around since the third century. Um, Instead, we're this new nation. Nations in Africa came into being in the 1950s. This is what they did. This is when we came into being. Therefore, we're a nation. It's a totally legitimate. So it's, it's, its claims to legitimacy as a nation are rooted much more in, in the colonial era than, than other, other places. Um, having said that, Eritrea is also very proud of its sort of what, what they call it. There's one, one slogan that says, um, uh, it's a slogan that says, Hadi Libi, one heart. And that means, um, Hadi Libi, Hadi Hizbi, one heart, one country. Um, and and that refers to the fact that the nine ethnic, the nine Eritrean ethnic groups and two major religions um, are all one. They're all fused into one Eritrean heart. Um, interestingly, it's a national slogan that gets mocked a lot, which is kind of unfortunate. I think that's actually one of the things that the Eritrean government has done right, is to try to sort of create this kind of synthetic, fusing kind of national identity. Um, there are nine ethnic groups. Um, the Tigrinya ethnic group comprises about 50% of the population. Um, they live disproportionately in the, in the central highlands of the country. They're also disproportionately recognized sort of represented among the educated people in the country. So you have a kind of default hegemony of the, the Tigrinya people, um, not because the government has designed it that way, but that's just demographically how things are aligned. Um, the other eight ethnic groups are sort of scattered in the coastal areas, in the lowlands, in the north part of the country. Um, they tend to be more scattered scattered about. Some of them are, um, are, are not settled peoples. Um, so it's, and, and they, they don't, um, so they haven't historically had as much education, although that's one thing that the government's trying to rectify. Um, so, it's, so you can see there's, there's sort of a problematic there, um, that, that they're trying to sort of create the sense of sort of holistic, non-ethnic nationalism, um, but at the same time it's really difficult to do when 50% of your population is sort of over, disproportionately represented in the, in the government and in the education system. Any other questions? Yeah. So you, you spoke about how before, um, like when you were there in 1985, there was a spirit of just like nationalism, and then the border, like the border war happened, and that mm -hmm. completely changed. Like, what, like what changed about that? Like I know you talk about this hyper between the nation and the state. Mm -hmm. Could you say that the that war kind of gave the framework or the structure that there is a state and then this oppressive power, and that completely changed or? How, like, where is that gap that they really switch this nationalism pride mm -hmm. to this kind of disdain for the power of the 
So it was a gradual, it, it was a very gradual process. Um, it wasn't something that happened overnight. Um, right around the border war, as happens in any war, when, when, you, when a country has a war, there's this sort of galvanizing of national sentiment, and people sort of get really excited and um, want to go off and defend the nation. Um, what happened, at the border war, the fighting in the border war wrapped up in 2000. As I was saying before, this entered into sort of a Cold War period where the border situation wasn't quite, quite wrapped up. For many years, there were a bunch of peacekeepers in the country, and then the peacekeepers got kicked out, so they weren't there. Um, but what happened a couple years after the border war um, is that the government started something called the Warsaw Ecology Development Campaign. And what this basically did is took the national service requirement, which was originally six months of military training and 12 months of free voluntary service to the country, which many people did in the military, um, some people did as teachers, some people did as civil servants. And what they basically did is instead of saying, okay, you're done after that point, you can leave the country, you can be free, you can do what you want, they effectively indefinitely extended that. And they said that everyone now has to continue to serve and sacrifice for the country. And the development campaign extended indefinitely. So now you have people who are sort of expecting the war is over, we're not fighting anymore, we sort of expect that the government is going to let us be free and go on with our lives. And many of those people are still in national service, and they have been in national service since, um, in some of the worst cases, 1995. So these are people who are going on many, many years of continuing to be in national service. So that was one thing that really kind of eroded national sentiments. Um, to make that worse, and this is something that I talked about in my article, um, the government had sort of wrapped, so, so you have a government that's heavily militarized, and it's wrapped a lot of its national sentiments around this notion of being Eritrea is, being Eritrean is being a soldier, being Eritrean is being a fighter and to defend the nation, um, being Eritrean is being, is being willing to sacrifice for the nation. So this is sort of one of the core tenets of national identity. Um, and then you take that mechanism that's intended to socialize people into sacrificing for the nation, national service, and you extend it indefinitely. Um, so what people started thinking was that, well, this isn't about serving the nation. This is about the government punishing us. This is about the government doing bad things to us. Um, around the same time, a lot of stories started circulating about abuses and mistreatment in national service, um, about commanding officers mistreating people, especially mistreating women in national service. Um, so that was all going on. Um, and at the same time, the government kept promising, we're going to hold elections, we're going to hold elections, we're going to hold elections, we're going to implement the Constitution, and they never did. So they lost a lot of legitimacy and credibility because of that. Um, so. What I argue is that it's a combination of the government's own policies that were seen as and felt as increasingly repressive and restrictive, um, and were indeed incredibly repressive and restrictive, combined with the fact that they'd, they'd set up nationalism to be about sacrifice for the good of the nation. Um, and they'd set up nationalism very much about trust in the government. The government will take care of you. And then the government turns around and doesn't take care of people and actually kind of uses people. So all of that over the years led to this sort of rolling back of, of the strong sentiment towards the nation. In the research, that was really interesting when you said that teachers might be leveraged on closeness with the state. Um, I was wondering if you saw that reflected in the interaction between students and teachers. Teachers leveraging their closeness with the state. I'm going to get, it's a, it's a, that's a complicated relationship, so I'm going to get into that a little bit next and take you guys into the classrooms. Did you ever see, uh, when you talk about how students interact with and that was reflected in how they would leverage with their teachers, students leveraging teachers. What do you mean? So a lot of times students learn how to interact with teachers based on how teachers interact with their superiors. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if students use leverage their own closeness with teachers to receive gifts. To receive gifts. Or to receive benefits. Yes. I think, I, I think they did in some, in some ways. And this is... Um, this is not something that I, I was going to sort of talk so much about today, but but yeah, there's there's a lot of Eritrea is a small country, and and this is something I, I wrote a little bit about the, the notion that the state is an intimate state that it's not the state is not out there somewhere. These are people that you know. These are people that have power, but but they're also people that you have an intimate relationship with. So so teachers were very much sort of leveraging their relationship with their, their superiors and trying to kind of use their own personal circumstances to try to get an outcome swung in one direction or another. Um, and students very much definitely did the same thing. So they, they would often use sort of very familial metaphors. So they would say the teacher is like, most of the teachers were men, um, the teacher is like my father. So you, you want your father to do this and you want to. I even on a couple of occasions had students, um, because my husband is a teacher, students coming up to me and sort of making a case for my husband to do something. And they're like, he's like my father. I want him to think well of me. I want you to present me in a good light to, to your to your teacher. So, so yeah, the, so there's very much a working of the intimate angle and a sort of leverage. And it turns out in this case, the student had, I thought he had a great case, but it turns out that he'd actually just sort of not shown up for class for about two months and 
uh, didn't have very good games, but, um, but he was, but it, but it was, so, and, and things like that happen also, where someone will sort of leverage a personal relationship that they have with one teacher to then sort of go and advocate for them with another teacher. So there's a lot of kind of recognizing that this is an intimate community, um, recognizing that your intimate relationships with one person might actually curry in favor in another. That's a really that's a really interesting question. I, I don't really feel prepared to completely answer that question. Um, the the Eritrea has no official language. Um, they have two working languages. One of which is Tigrinya, which is spoken by fifty percent of the population. Um, the other, which is Arabic. Um, which is a second language for about the other 50% of the population, although not exactly because the other 50% of the population are more or less, are mostly Muslim, so they, they, the idea is that Arabic is the language they work in. Um, and in certain parts of the country, Arabic sort of functions as, it's very few people's first language, but it functions as a working language in government and other, and other areas. It's sort of a common language that people in more multi-ethnic areas um, communicate in. Um, it was a real divide. The government had a very, very strong mother tongue education policy in the primary schools. So they believed really strongly primary school education should be in your mother tongue. It took them a while to get that up and running because of the resources needed to create curriculum in nine different languages. Um, and that education in secondary schools was all in English. Um, but what that, what that did is sort of not really acknowledge the kind of default power that the Tigrinya language had because 50% of the population and most of the educated people tended to speak it. So if you want to get ahead in Eritrea, you have to speak Tigrinya. But it wasn't ever taught in the education system unless you were a Tigrinya, an ethnic Tigrinya speaker and were born into a Tigrinya family. Um, so, so I don't know the question about nationalism and, and language. I know that the official government policy was to promote, um, to promote a sort of multilingual form of nationalism. That's again, that's tied up with the whole one heart policy, that we're, we're nine peoples, we have nine languages, all of the languages are valued. Um, but the default is that when you have a dominant language like that, if anyone wants to get ahead in education or professionally, they're going to need to speak that language. So there's, so there's a lot of debate about that. The teachers were mostly um, from the Tigrinya speaking groups. Um, and they tend, often they said, we think all the students should have to learn Tigrinya. Um, and they didn't mean that to be hegemonic or dominating. Um, they thought that that was the best way to help all of the students get ahead. Um, and indeed, the students who did wind up getting ahead, even if they didn't speak Tigrinya at home, they, they did wind up speaking Tigrinya. Um, so I don't have data, because I didn't do the study, I think it'd be a fascinating study to do, about how people who were not Tigrinya speakers from those other eight ethnic groups, how they felt about that. I would imagine that they have a very complicated, problematic relationship with the nation. Um, it's, not quite the, it's not quite the same as others, I just don't have the data on that. So just to piggyback off of that, does each school then kind of decide the language the school will use? No, the government decides. Oh, for what area? For elementary schools, yeah. The government sort of designates that this is an Arabic-speaking school, or this is an Afar-speaking school, or this is a Tigrinya-speaking school. Well, there's a couple of reasons why we're not going to go back, but there's a lot of mistrust on our part about whether they will they let him leave again. Um, it took a very many years and a long process of trying to get him out. Um, so, so national service, we, we finally sort of found an escape clause, a, a loophole in, in their rules and convinced, and did a lot of hard work to, to enable him to, to get out. Um, so, so national service is on the books, according to law, is, consist, is supposed to consist of six months of military training and then 12 months of voluntary service, either in the military or another place where you're sort of designated. Um, for the people, the people for whom it's indefinitely extended, it can mean two things. The vast majority of those people continue to serve in the military. Um, and the government's rationale for this is we're still in an ongoing state of emergency. Ethiopia could attack at any time. We need to maintain all of these people in the military. But it's been a very long time. To, you can't maintain people on war footing for that long. Um, for a smaller group of people, um, it's, um, it, they serve as civil servants. Um, since I've left, many of those people serving in a civil capacity actually have been demobilized. And for those people who are serving as teachers or in another capacity, the government has actually gotten better about your year is up and now we're going to demobilize you. Um, when I was there at the time, there was tremendous uncertainty. So nobody knew. So, so teachers were, what, what that meant for them was that they were, they were not getting their salary. 
So they would get a very small amount of pocket money um, that amounted to about $5 a month. Um, so they basically had to continue doing their jobs without, without any pay. Um, and they couldn't get an exit visa to leave the country, and they sort of could be called up by the, by the government at any time. They were sort of within the government's um, register as someone who was in national service. So if there was another war, they could be called up. Although that's true for anyone anywhere at, at the time anyway. Does that answer your question? And percentages, um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I know in one of the articles, um, it's very hard to know, and I haven't seen percentages that, that I'm completely comfortable with. I know I, 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 I did put a percentage that I got from somebody else's work in one of the articles that you circulated. I just can't remember off the top of my head what it was. I think it was sort of in the range of um, 20 or 30 percent. So it's a sizable percentage of people in the country. But it's very, it's very difficult to know and because no, nobody's releasing any records. Yeah. How are Western influences taught in Eritrean schools? Because I was wondering because I know a couple from Eritrea. I met them in Japan and the husband could not go back to Eritrea because when the border, border war ended, he was in Ethiopia and he became a refugee and he came to Japan as a refugee. And he met his wife in Japan, and his wife is from Eritrea, but he's, she is one of those Eritreans that's working overseas, and that was working overseas. And when they, after, when they, get, they got married in Japan, they, they told me that they would love to fight for their country and get killed, because that's what they want. At the same time, they can't go back to Eritrea because he doesn't have a visa and, and passport and everything. So I really wondered, and some of the, some of the people in Japan even told me that, the, the supporting group of those couple told me that, oh, Western influence, they didn't even set the border themselves. So like, there's like another extreme way of like thinking, like seeing, looking at the mm -hmm. border war. So I really wondered how people are taught, like uh, how people, uh, uh, the Western influences were taught in Eritrean schools and how government or teachers or students were thinking about uh, how to perceive that Western influences. So West, so what do you mean by Western influences? Col colonial, colonial, colonial because, because, because of the border and everything. And yeah, that's a, that's a really big question. I mean, like, like I was saying before, Italian colonialism um, is, to say it's celebrated is probably a bit of an overstatement, but it's certainly not I mean, Italian colonialism is really given credit for Eritrea existing. Um, they also talk about some of the industrial advances, that there's railroad built under the Italian era, the factories were brought. So they sort of praise Italian colonialism for kind of modernizing the country. Um, Ethiopian colonialism, which is referred to as colonialism, um, is, or imperialism, um, is completely demonized. And all of Eritrea's problems are because of Ethiopian colonialism. Um, there's a lot of stuff in both English, English textbooks and curriculum, as well as social science and social studies history um, text and curriculum, that sort of talks about our character. Our character as Eritreans was born for the way we withstood atrocities under the Ethiopian regime. Um, so that's so that's how those kinds of influences. Um, another interesting thing is that Eritrea is a very very isolationist nation. Um, they continue to sort of say we're not going to bow to pressures of the rest of the world. Eritrea um, currently um, there have been sanctions um, passed against it in the UN for its alleged involvement in Somalia. Um, and, and other things, um, and they've sort of constantly said these are the lies created by the international community. And some of that is in the school textbooks as well, um, not not in that extreme language, but but the, the story of the independence of Eritrea is very much narrated as the international community was being convinced by Ethiopia that Eritrea was part of Ethiopia, so they didn't take our plea for independence into consideration, which is why we didn't get independence after Italian the Italian period or after there was a British period in between um, Italy and Ethiopia. Um, and, and so it's the international community not ever supporting us that is partly responsible. They're not entirely wrong. I mean, this is not a, this is not a, this is not a complete misconstrual of history. It's a slam on history. It's a particular argument. But these were sort of uncertain times where that's that's a valid argument that a lot of historians make as well. Um, but that's the way they sort of slant their history and talk about the world. So they sort of use that as um, sort of a legitimate platform from which they sort of say, well, we have the right to be isolationists because we can't trust anyone in the world um, because they um, they have, they betrayed us again. Sort of the narrative of the betrayed nation. I think Eritrea, the Eritrean government has used the border war and the 
ongoing unresolved border situation as an excuse to not liberalize in all kinds of ways, both to not hold elections, to not implement the Constitution. They've effectively sort of, what was a sort of informal, unofficially declared state of emergency around the time of the border war has kind of been extended indefinitely under the auspices of the border war is not, is not entirely under. This is not unusual. Places like Burma have done this. Um, any, any country that, that has an authoritarian regime that feels like it's constantly under attack can create a sort of sense of siege. What they do is they sort of securitize the whole nation and say, our government is the only one that can protect the nation from these outside threats. Um, so the whole sense of nationalism kind of becomes securitized. And there's this sort of ongoing sense of, of, of the siege state. A lot of scholars of Eritrea have written about the sort of notion of the siege state in Eritrea. Um, so the governments definitely use that. Um, people are not buying it. Um, many of the Eritreans in the diaspora who are very politically active are buying it. But Eritreans in Eritrea um, are very much not buying it. They sort of, they can't actively oppose it because there's no way to oppose the government. Um, but people are sort of fed up with it. So that's an answer. That, yes, the government is kind of galvanizing the border war to continue to engage in certain kinds of policies, but it's not working. And that's part of the reason why there's been a sort of delegitimation of the government's version of nationalism. Um, your second question was about the border war itself. I mean, this is just, just purely my opinion, and there's lots and lots of people who disagree with me. I, I think Ethiopia has bigger things to worry about. I, I, I don't think Ethiopia um, has... Um, I, I, think, I think if Ethiopia were to try to retake Eritrea, or even to retake certain parts of Eritrea, it would cause them more political problems than it's worth. Ethiopia has been on a... Now, many Eritreans think that that's not true. Many scholars think that that's not true, um, especially Eritrean scholars. Um, but, but Ethiopia has sort of consistently kind of positioned itself as a U.S. ally. It's consistently positioned itself as sort of a benevolent regional power. Um, even if it's not, that's how they position themselves. Um, they've consistently positioned themselves as we are a good reforming country, even though Ethiopia certainly has, has its own share of problems. Um, so they position themselves in all these ways that, that they're doing all kinds of things um, economically to try to sort of show that they're on a trajectory towards growth. Um, so Ethiopia wants to be seen in a good light in terms, of, in terms of the international community and in terms of sort of doing the right things. Um, so if it were to sort of re-engage in a conflict with Eritrea, first I think they're smart enough now to realize that that conflict would never end. That, that that would be that would be Eritreans would fight pretty much until everyone was the country was totally decimated to, to defend the, the territorial integrity of Eritrea. Um, but I think that they also know that that's not going to gain them anything. Ethiopia is better off on the trajectory that it is, and it's sort of more trouble than it's worth. So that's my my sort of scholarly mm -hmm. opinion on it. But that's a kind of hotly <coughs> debated point. I have to let Dan in. Is the Hi. is the boss happy? Like, um, you may have covered this already, but my recollection is that one of the reasons why there was this contemporary war with uh, Eritrea was around access to water, mm -hmm. uh, that is to say maritime yeah. boats, uh, ports, and uh, aren't they, uh, what kind of arrangements have they made economically to get to the sea? I guess this would be the So Ethiopia has invested pretty heavily in Djibouti's port. Um, I think they're also using um, some of Kenya's ports as well. Um, so I think Ethiopia's kind of made other arrangements. I mean, what's ironic, I don't, I don't really buy that that's, that, that might have been an aggravating factor, but I don't, a sort of agitating factor in the border war. I don't buy that that was the main reason, because Ethiopia effectively had free access to the sea through the port of Austin. Um, they, they had an arrangement with Eritrea where they could use that, but that was effective, that was, that was Ethiopia's port. Also, which is where I lived, it, it had the, it was, an, it was an, clearly Eritrea, but there were lots of Ethiopians that lived there. Um, it was a very vibrant town. There was a lot of Ethiopian, much more Ethiopian traffic coming um, the Eritrean traffic. So they had that. They had sea access. And the border war actually cut that off because that was the first thing that happened was we're fighting with each other, you can't use our port. Um, so yeah, yeah, there is some speculation that they really like port access. But I think they sort of recognize that the, the or maybe they don't recognize this, maybe I'm being too optimistic. I, I tend to be, my, my analyses tend to be optimistic because I like to have the glass half full, um, especially when it comes to international politics because otherwise it's so weak and you just sort of um, But, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I think that, I think, Ethiopia, I think, probably has a better chance of getting access to the sea through Eritrea's port by through an alliance of some sort. But that's not going to happen as long as the current leader in Eritrea is in place. And it wouldn't have happened when the previous leader in Ethiopia, who, who passed away recently, was in place. Um, I'm optimistic that now that Ethiopia's under new leadership, maybe there might be some change, but I think it's going to take leadership change in Eritrea before any of that changes. But um, Eritrea's pretty economically kind of hamstrung until it has a, a better relationship with and of course, there. if they open the port, that would drive a lot of taxes. And, I mean, if they could yeah. work out, I mean, that's a real bonus. Right? It's a win-win solution. It's, um, it was it was a vibrant town um, when it was functioning as an 
support, and it just completely turned into a ghost town. So it wasn't good for the town, it wasn't good for the country, it wasn't good for either of them. I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was a lose lose when that didn't work out. Yeah, last question. Um, I don't know whether this question would qualify as an academic question, but still it is, I have to say. Uh, the thing is, uh, in your presentation and even in your readings, uh, the two stakeholders, the state and the teachers, uh, executive body versus, what do you say, people working on behalf of the state, uh, there's a discrepancy between the way they have, uh, they view national identity mm -hmm. and uh, the way it is being education system is being used as a medium to instill this value or emotion and something like that. And your writings, at least according to me, have single-handedly brought about the discrepancy between the tone of the two conversations which are happening between the two entities. So I was just wondering, have you presented this data to the ministry or to the executive body? I mean, I mean, when you have this discrepancy so obviously in front of you, the I mean the way you are pitching the policy and the way the people who are supposed to execute it do not agree with it. I mean, does this data make any difference at the executive level? I mean, have you presented it anywhere and did you see any scope or hope of change in the conversation? No, no, I haven't presented it. I, I, um, I, I assume that given the tenor of the Eritrean regime and how they feel about criticism of the regime and anyone who says anything about it as well, I, that I'm not welcome there. <laughs> um, I would worry that if I went there that, that friends and family who I might visit might actually be in danger, so, so, I, so I won't go back to Eritrea. Having said that, if anyone from the Eritrean government read my articles and approached me and said, we are really concerned about this and you make some really good points, I would be thrilled. Um, but I think that they're pretty dug in. Um, and I think they're pretty dug into the idea that, that what they're doing works. Um, and I think it's I, I think it's more important for them to sort of continue with the program as they see it rather than to look at where it's not working. I think that, um, I mean, I'm, as an ethnographer, my ideas don't come out of my head. I mean, I'm sort of putting a theoretical spin on them. But these are ideas and ways of thinking that came out of my research participants in the, in the study. Um, so so these are ideas that other people within the Eritrean government sort of have. And some people did try to bring this to them. And, I think that's sort of the powers would be, but but I'll let you know if anyone calls me up from the Ministry of Education or the President's office at Eritrea and says we're, we're really concerned about this. You make some really good points. I would be so happy, but but, it, but it's not it's not that type of regime. I mean, you know, you know, people within the world of educational research, this is a constant tension. Your research should have impact, which means you should be affecting policy or practice in some way, um, and and of course in this kind of context, you really can't. Um, at least not in the direct context that I did that I did research in. So, which is frustrating. It doesn't mean that I don't think it's important research and have this knowledge. Um, but my hope would also be, and this is sort of a next step for me in my own research, is that this is, this. I don't think this is limited territory. I think that there's some particular idiosyncrasies that come out of a condition of authoritarianism. But I think that a lot of, a lot of these kinds of things that I found I don't think are unusual, certainly not to other parts of Africa and probably not to other places either. So my hope would be that while I don't expect the Eritrean government to read this, that maybe people in the Ministry of Education in other countries might read this and say, hey, this is important. This is interesting. This is how are we doing for time, by the way? It is 3.05. It's 3.05. Um, so should we keep going with questions? Should I sort of plow through the rest of the presentation? What do you guys you. think? I'm happy to continue asking questions, or I'm happy to talk um, through what else I've got. Or, um, what do you guys think? Questions. 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 Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me just, um, I won't go through the rest of the, the PowerPoint. Um, you guys will have it, and you, can, and you can look at it yourself. This is just sort of a summary of some of the the arguments that I'm making, and um, my plan was to, to give you a little bit of my anthropographic data, but most of it comes out of the articles that you guys have already, so you can um, read those and get a sense of those. Um, this is something that I will just flag a little bit, although it's kind of come up in, in questions and conversations. In 2003, when my field work started, um, there was a new policy reform called the Rapid Transformation of the Eritrean Education System. There were many components to this, which I won't get into, but one of the really significant ones, which is really key and, and important to understand, is that all high school seniors were required to attend a boarding school for the final year of high school, which was located and seamlessly integrated into the beginning of military training. So students actually had to begin military training before their final year of high school. So there was no escape. Um, what happened was people were sort of trying to avoid military training and hide out, and then suddenly the government kind of tightened up that mechanism. At the same time, in the, in the high schools in particular, the promotion policy used to be highly selective. There was a national examination, and very few people could pass it. Um, and suddenly they just sort of, sort of started pushing people through, and 
um, and integrated the assessment process with national service as well. Um, at the same time, they, they wound up dismantling and eventually entirely rebuilding, but at the time that I was doing field work, we didn't know this, um, the entire tertiary education system so that it was part of the system. So they effectively kind of militarized the entire education system so that military national service was embedded in the education system itself. And that further kind of blurs the lines between what's national service, what's not national service. Are you a student? Are you a soldier? Are you in national service? Are you a student? Where, what's your, there's no clear categories because all these categories were kind of fused. Um, and then I can talk a little bit more about my data and questions, or you can just ask me questions about the articles, but I just thought I'd put up these pictures of the two, the two schools. This is the senior secondary school, um, and this is the junior secondary school. And then I had an interesting little vignette about um, teachers' efforts. As a result of all the stuff that was going on at the time of my field work, um, student behavior radically declined. So students were cutting classes, they were trying to escape from school, they were showing up for late, for school late. Um, you took schools that had historically and traditionally been very ordered, that students were very disciplined, and um, not anything most of us would recognize the students, and suddenly nobody was acting like a student, according to the teachers, um, and everyone was trying to escape from school. So I had a vignette that I was going to share with you guys about how the teachers in the junior secondary school actually locked the school gate, um, and there was a gate that was already sort of topped by broken glass and things. So they locked the school gate, and then when the students started throwing rocks at the gate saying, let us in, they called the police and had all the students arrested. Um, this was combined with a whole bunch of other draconian measures that they took in order to kind of clamp down and crack down on the students. Um, so there's questions to be raised about well, what kind of state actors are, are teachers in light of that kind of behavior. Um, meanwhile, in the senior secondary school, um, teachers um, didn't have a wall around their compound. And as you can see, it was a very wide compound with the buildings very spread out. Um, so these teachers got a donation of shipping containers, and also it was a port, so there were lots of shipping containers around which looked like these. And they put a wall made of shipping containers around the school. Um, so what we have here is, in essence, teachers who um, feel abandoned by their, their sort of superior people in the Ministry of Education are getting absolutely no support from higher levels of the state. So they have to take matters into their own hands. They have to act as the state in their own right. Um, they have to act as sovereign. Um, so you have in both cases a sense that we've been abandoned by the state, so we have to take matters into our own hands. And so this is the notion of teacher sovereignty that I alluded to in the title. Um, and teachers sort of becoming sovereign in their own rights um, and feeling like, well, we can do whatever we want with the students. Um, meanwhile, in senior secondary school, this was kind of a joke because the students kept slipping out between the holes in the shipping containers and they kept slipping. Um, in the junior secondary school, it worked pretty well, but they had to resort to having several students arrested. Um, and a bunch of other students sort of got the crap beat out of them in this process. So this was, this was a very sort of violent measure. So this sheds light on teachers' limitations as the state, but also the, the lengths that they were willing to go to to make sure that students became educated under these kinds of circumstances. Um, so that's one of the arguments that I make in my, in my work more broadly, is trying to tease out the complexities of what kind of state actors are teachers. Um, are they the violent state, or are they the sympathetic state? Um, in other instances, teachers sort of joined in with students in their kind of generalized resistance to mass militarization. Um, so you have students who are showing up for class, and you have teachers who are showing up for class. You have students who show up three weeks late for the school year, and you have teachers who show up four weeks late for the school year. Um, you have students who haven't done their work to prepare for class, and a lot of teachers who haven't done the same. So, so on the other hand, so you have teachers sort of being strict and trying to kind of enact a moral order in a time of moral decline in schools, but then you also have teachers who are joining in with students in a form of resistance. Um, and then the third way in which teachers act as the state, which again, you have to be a little bit um, more optimistic, um, is one of the elements of the policy reform was to get teachers to teach in a more learner-centered way. Um, and this actually had some really interesting side effects. So you had all these teachers who were sort of engaging in learner-centered activities in the classrooms. Um, and many of the ways in which this happened actually gave students an opportunity to debate the nation, to debate national identity, and in some cases to directly critique the government that would not have been available to them in this context anywhere else. So some of these are some examples of the debate topics that students um, talked about in one of my articles that was circulated. I talked about one debate in particular, the debate about leaving the country or staying in the country. Um, so this is a sort of more optimistic way. The teachers acted as the state by engaging students as critical subjects and enabling students to be critical of the state in a way that wouldn't have otherwise existed. I'm wondering, maybe again, I know you covered this, but in what sense, what was the inspiration of the uh, state agencies, whether it's the Ministry of Education or the military? Who were they looking to as models? I, mean, were, I know they were mad at Ethiopia, yeah. to say the least, but I can't believe they didn't borrow some of the same things happening in Ethiopia, or maybe even derived from Italy, or maybe derived from. Saudi Arabia, who knows? I mean, models, for, models for the education system. Yeah, 
Uh, it doesn't appear out of nowhere, or is it yeah. so unique that nobody's ever seen it? So, so you mean the structure of the education system? Yeah. or so it, so it was really kind of a smorgasbord of a whole bunch of different things. I think one of the problems is, or I don't know if it's a problem or not, but, but that there, there was not a really clear model. So one of the interesting things when I arrived was that all the teachers sort of were saying, we're adopting the Texas curriculum standards. <laughs> and everyone was making jokes about how the Ministry of Education was going to quit making wear cowboy hats. Um, a couple of months later, and I know that this was a plan, because I actually got an email asking for consultants to adapt the Eritrean curriculum to the Texas curriculum standards. Um, Two months later, nobody was talking about that. And, and, when, I, and when I interviewed um, Ministry of Education officials a couple months later, everyone was like, oh no, we were never going to adopt Texas. We take some of, we, 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 and, and this one guy pulled this big stack of different curricula from different countries. I think one of them was Singapore, and he rattled off like half a dozen different countries that they were, that they were drawing from. Um, so they sort of saw themselves as sort of adapting different kinds of things. But the one element of the policy reform that was most stringently implemented was sort of unique, this whole idea of militarizing the education system. That was specifically Eritrean, this idea that we can embed the, the education system in the military. Um, the ideas about mass promotion, I think, came a lot out of, um, they're documented in a lot of World Bank literature that sort of says Eritrea's um, education system is inefficient, there's too many people who fail, we need to look more efficient. So that's one influence on the promotion policy. But they twisted it again and made it part of the militarized system. Um, and the learner-centered pedagogies, I think, were coming from a lot of different directions. Um, they, I think they were, again, coming from sort of some of the big organizations. I went to a, a training, which was really fascinating, that was um, sponsored by DeMita, um, where they were sort of training teachers and educational administrators on learner-centered pedagogies. So that, and that was an idea. The British Council had also been really active in promoting learner-centered pedagogies for a number of years. Peace Corps had been really active in that. So there were a lot of influences pushing in that direction and trends in that. In that direction. So different components of it, I think, were pulled from different directions. Um, there was also a really strong strand of education should be practical, it should be job oriented, it should be skill oriented, but that didn't really ever go anywhere from the perspective of. Yeah, that was kind of, uh, it's interesting to hear that there are those many inputs, and sometimes too many inputs and in having no grounding in a model can also be disruptive. When you right. create debates within the system, people working it out, some buying Texas cats, <laughs> other people who are doing other things, and then one day is fashionable, another day is something else. Yeah. I'm just wondering how, like, yeah, how crazy uh, that system was, or did they feel like, oh, well, we're just dabbling these other things, we really know what we're doing. Uh, what's the sense of? I, th I think that all of these other things that were going on were really cover for them to do what they wanted with the education system, which was to embed in the military, um, and to set up this boarding facility for students and to make sure that the, that the tertiary system and the secondary system were all aligned. So everything for national defense. Yeah. I can't help but think that it's not that terribly different from the Israeli system. No. Did they look at the Israeli system? Yeah. Eritrea's had a, a sort of complicated relationship with Israel, but yes, is, well, Israel is... As a system. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I'm sure, yeah. It, it's not entirely different. That and especially as a system of national service. Small country, big opponents. Yeah. Yeah, when I interviewed people, nobody specifically mentioned Israel, um, but I know that Israel has had a strong influence on, on Eritrea, um, so that's completely plausible to me. Yeah. Also, as it is a high, very highly sort of centralized place, um, I think that it could be that sort of the person, the people at the top, up to the president, had an idea of what was going on. Meanwhile, various agencies and organizations and models are engaging other actors down here who don't really have any power. So I think that's where you get the fragmentation of, we're going to have this guy work on learning set of pedagogy, we're going to have this guy work on Texas, we're going to have these people do different things, but they don't actually have the political power. So the president and the party leaders who were saying, this is what we want, and they weren't necessarily looking at models, um, were the ones who sort of wound up having the influence that um, in any under-resourced school district, what gets privileged is often sort of, it's a, the power system is opaque in terms of who actually makes the final decision. Can I ask you one more thing? Sure. <laughs> Has anybody from the University of Pennsylvania, after you, gone there to do any kind of consulting or development with your attorney? Not that I'm aware of. Are you aware of? Are aware of any? any? Um, <laughs> I have a... Our gal. I have a... <laughs> I, I know I know of some people who have been not not in recent years. I, I don't know anyone who's been able to go and do sort of extensive ethnographic research. I have a friend who's in public health at Columbia, um, who was in Peace Corps with me, who was able to go in and do some research um, a few years after I was. But then she, she had a decent because it's public health research and it's not particularly threatening. 
to the government, she was able to sort of go and do research, but then somebody that she engaged with while she was there sort of disappeared after she left, and, and that was alarming to her, so she decided not to, not to go back. Um, so not, not in recent years. There certainly have been people since I was there who have gone in and done stuff, and um, the more kind of pragmatic, less threatening research, people certainly can, can go in and do it, but not, not if you're going to sort of tell the true story of what the government's actually doing, but then, then they don't really want to. So is this kind of just a bit more an answer to your question, but because of your personal experience, have you done work with their Chinese passwords? And what is their relationship with the state today for the most part, in terms of their feelings about what's happening and whether or not things go with that bond? So there's there's some researchers who are doing really, really great research on that. Can you give me their names if you're if you're curious? Um, I, I've been a little on the I haven't done that research yet. I've thought about it. Um, it's sort of been on my to-do list for a long time. Um, I've, I've wanted to, um, and I and I'm sort of just on the fence about it. It's a different kind of research, and I'm not honestly I'm not quite sure why I'm sort of hesitating about about doing that. Maybe because my interest for so long has been in the state and state institutions and things like that, and you get a different perspective when you're getting people who are outside of the state. But there's some people who have done really really fine research on that. So if you're curious about what I've done, you've had your hand up for a long time. Sorry. Uh, I have two ideas. One is from the media, one is from the participation. I think you mentioned like independence for the night. In 91, so in that period, like there was a feeling of coming glory mm -hmm. of achievement. So that's a pretty good United element for for like uh, state in the state building. But then you have you start having some problems that emerge, and they like the concept of graduated citizenship, mm -hmm. like how they're like the ones that are spread through is different than the ones inside. Don't you think that the fact that students, as you mentioned in the reading, start to feel aware, uh, to feel aware of this difference? The, the dis yeah, that's exactly the point um, I was trying to make in that article, the disconnect between the Eritreans and diaspora and Eritreans and Eritrea, and there's a really strong, again, this is, there's a lot of research on the Eritrean diaspora, how, how strongly nationalistic they are, how much the, the Eritrean government has cultivated that nationalism, because there's very strong government institutions in the diaspora. Um, the concept of graduated citizenship, I can't take credit for it, it's Iowa Ong's concept, so Iowa Ong has developed it much more than I have, I just sort of borrowed it and adapted it. Um, but, but yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't think so much violence and confrontation because they, these two groups don't typically encounter each other very much. And, and Eritreans and Eritreans sort of admire, admire and covet what the diaspora has. So when members of the diaspora, when their family members and things like that come to Eritrea, they, that's a favorable relationship. Like they have money, they can do things, they can take you out, they can bring you presents. Um, they can maybe get you out of the country at some point um, if they have enough money. Um, so it's not so much a clashing relationship because these people are all in the same families. Everyone has relatives who are outside of the country. Um, it's an intimate relationship. Um, but I think that there's, I think where the clash and the tension comes in is around the national imaginary. And I don't think that, that Eritrea can continue to sort of require that its territorial citizens sacrifice when there's this model of other citizens who get to come and go and enjoy the country. And I think that that's, that's what I was trying to point out in that article, that that's what's breaking down. And that's what got debated in the, in the classroom debate and what, what circulated so well. Um, remind me of it, your second question about the loop, I think it's exactly, I think that's exactly it. That um, I, I think, in, in the, from what I've heard, and I haven't been able to get as much data on this as I would like because it's very hard to get information, I have heard that in the years since I left, one thing that the Eritrean government has improved on is that now people who score highly on their national exams and go on to tertiary education actually are released from national service. So at this point, whereas when I was doing fieldwork, nobody knew whether that was going to happen, nobody trusted it. So, he, so it was a feedback loop where some people were dropping out of school. But now I think there's actually, an, if you're very, very bright, and you know that you can pass this very difficult national examination after you complete your military training, 
um, you have a pretty good chance of going on to tertiary education. So for those, for that group of people, they're incentivized to keep going. But there's a bunch of people who sort of know I'm never going to amount to anything, and they're actually leaving the country in greater and greater numbers at really young ages, like 10, 11, 12, um, before they even get into secondary school. Um, or senior secondary school because they know that once they're in senior secondary school they're on that track towards the military and if they don't feel really confident that they're bright enough to pass the national exam at some point they're leaving and, and that's exactly the cycle. So the government's partially, for the best and the brightest, the government's partly addressed that. Um, so the best and the brightest are continually um, sort of incentivized to stay in the system unless they're just fed up with the controlling nature of the government, which a lot of people are, so a lot of people are not are leaving for other reasons. Um, but but the people but it's all it's all those other people who are sort of disincentivized to get any education and they sort of wind up in refugee camps or somewhere else in a lot of cases. Um, I heard a presentation last summer um, from someone who had visited some of the refugee camps in um, in Ethiopia who was just sort of talking about how alarming it is that really young the refugee camps first of all are mostly filled with young men which is very unusual for a refugee camp which is usually filled with, with women and children. Um, but then a lot of these young young men coming into refugee camps are, are very young that they're they're that they're chill, unaccompanied minors coming. Okay, so we probably only have, who's had their hand up? I'm sorry, I can't remember. Okay. Um, I have two questions. The first is, um, it, it, it says in the article that a uh, big part of the country's budget comes from people in the diaspora. I was wondering what kind of um, jobs are enable them to be sending so much money and who uh, gets to be part, of, a member of this um, like the category that the government has created. So what kinds of jobs among the people in the diaspora do you yeah, have so much? Who the diaspora? How do they choose who um, is that? How do the, so you're asking how does the diaspora get to be the diaspora? How do they get to be? No, no. Who, who composes it and what oh, okay. kinds of jobs are they getting to be able to be sending so much money? So it's really, it's, it's really random. I mean, for, for, for the diaspora to, to significantly contribute to the Eritrean government, it doesn't have to be a large amount of money because it's a very small economy. Um, so, the, so these are most people in the Eritrean diaspora are not doing jobs that are um, extraordinary. I mean, there are some there are some very wealthy members of the Eritrean diaspora. There's people who have high level professional jobs. Um, it's it's an overwhelmingly pretty well educated diaspora community. Um, but this is also a community of immigrants, so they're also doing um, jobs like working in parking garages and driving taxis and, and things like that. Um, the Eritrean government has a mandatory two percent tax that all Eritreans, regardless of where you live, has, has to have to pay. If you want any Eritrean government services, if you need a passport, if you hope to go back and visit the country, if your family in Eritrea wants to buy land, um, if you want to officially send money to your family in Eritrea, you have to pay this 2% tax. Um, so that's been very controversial over recent years. Is that okay for the Eritrean government to do this? Are these Eritrean citizens? Are they not? Um, by the time your diaspora, if you're a small country, um, there's about a million Eritreans in the diaspora. By the time those million people each pay 2% of their salary, even if their salary isn't very much, um, that's a big chunk of income for a small country like Eritrea. Um, that has a very, very small economy to start with. Um, so that's sort of generally um, kind of where it comes from, and why they can contribute so much. But it's also a huge sacrifice. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of money for people. I mean, one, of the, one of the sort of moves in the diaspora as people get more unhappy with the government is to not pay the 2% tax. But honestly, a lot of people aren't willing to do that because they want to be able to have communication with their family. And the, se the second one, sorry, sorry. is that uh, one of the, the issues that stands out um, to me is if I understood correctly, the teachers haven't chosen to be teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, what is? I'm wondering what the sense of vocation or where is their inspiration? Like every day in the classroom, you know, if they haven't chosen that. So, so I had a dissertation chapter called "The Noble Profession That No One Wants," um, and that's because teachers consistently describe teaching in these sort of idealistic, lofty terms that being a teacher is noble, and we get to shape students, and this is wonderful, and and we're, we're teaching them their national identities, and this is very noble, special work. Um, so they had a sense of the value of it, but because of the way the profession was structured, that out of all, so teachers actually do pretty well, because it's an educated profession in a country where most people don't have very much education. Um, but they see themselves as sort of the lowest status of all the educated professions, and they see themselves, because the country needs so many teachers, they see themselves as really stuck. So whereas other professions can kind of move and maybe get opportunities for a scholarship to study someone else, I think because there's, sheer, uh, there's so many teachers that they sort of see themselves as, we don't get to move, we don't get to move up. We don't, uh, my teachers kept saying to me, we don't, we, teachers don't grow up. And what they were talking about there was they never experienced a status change. Um, this is not dissimilar to teachers anywhere, really, where there's not a lot of status change over the course of a, a career in teaching. Um, 
So they sort of saw it as, well, we didn't do well enough in school to sort of be an engineer or a doctor or something like that, so we're stuck being a teacher, and this is a sort of disrespected profession. And so that, that's kind of where that, where that comes from. Well, thank you guys very much. This has been a really engaging, stimulating talk. I wish I could stay and talk with you longer, but unfortunately I have to go pick up my kids who are going to be stranded at a bus stop or something like that if I don't <laughs> right away. But thank you so much for having me, and I hope this is <laughs>